Lord, use her right now. Hallelujah, use her right now. You sitting up here talking about, oh Lord, I need a hundred thousand dollars. And by next week, eat up a oh. Mm. Oh, I, I felt 50,000, right? Eh, that go 30. I shot out 20. Heal him, Lord. Heal him in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for healing right now. It's that moment I was, it's that moment I was talking about. Dear God, it's glory. Take it, pastors. Take it in Jesus' name. Take it in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. That's glory. You say, but I may not have $300 right now. Well, what do you have? Do you have a hundred? Do you have 150? Take a step of faith toward God right now. But everyone who wants to move to greatness, listen to the voice of God, $300. Release it to God and watch. He's ready to see the Holy Ghost move. American Evangelical Church in Freefall. Recent findings from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found a growing decline in Christian beliefs and church attendance. I've never really been into organized religion. My parents made it a point to not bring it up when my sisters and I were growing up. There's been a big drop in the number of folks going to church, but there's one group in particular who is staying away from Sunday service. Church attendance for middle-aged folks is falling faster than any other age group. Honestly, I never felt anything sitting in a house of worship. I don't go to church. God don't live in church. They say the body is the temple. I'm walking in church right now. In a recent survey, more than a third of Gen Z identify as non-religious. In fact, Gen Z is the least Christian generation, being most likely to identify as atheist or agnostic than any other generation. But this didn't start with Gen Z. Each generation following the silent generation has been getting less and less Christian. In 2020, over 60% of Americans identified as Christian, down from 90% 50 years ago. Data shows that more and more young people are leaving organized religion each year. I had grown up so Christian and lived in the church practically every Sunday. But as I grew, I realized that I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. The Bible says, praise him with stringed instruments. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. He shall lie. preacher wants the Holy Ghost. Are you ready? Yeah! Too many 
many preachers have gone out and called the name of God and they made mockery of the ministry. And I'm not going to be one of them. Natural retardation, you can't help that. That's a birth defect. But you don't have to be spiritually retarded. That's right. Amen. That's a problem. Right. For many of us, our beliefs and fondest memories revolve around Christianity. It is a faith that we have been taught throughout generations from our forefathers, grandparents, and parents. Somebody say old time church. See, nobody wants to do it that way anymore. The way mama did it, the way granny did it, the way pa did it, the way daddy did it. It's too old fashioned now. Right. Well, the way they did it worked, folks. Let me tell you something. It worked until everybody started rebelling against it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's been good to me. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he hasn't just been keeping me alive, Lord. But he's kept me safe. Have you ever stopped to wonder about this faith that you and a large portion of the world upholds? Today's church buildings are where people go for Sunday morning worship and fellowship. It is a time to reflect, repent, and dress in one Sunday best. The church as we know it today is called a house for the sick. But is this true according to the scriptures? Have we really been serving our Creator by the book? You might find it surprising to learn that many traditions and aspects of our Sunday morning church practices aren't directly rooted in the teachings of Yahushua Messiah the apostles, or the scriptures. When you hear us say Yahushua, just know that we are referring to the original Hebrew name of the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus. We would like to give a warning. If you're not open to a thorough examination of Christianity, it's advisable to stop listening here and continue in whatever you believe in immediately save yourself from the potential trouble of having your life turned upside down and questioning your Christian walk. There is a small group of people all over the world who are awakening, mm -hmm. who are beginning to understand that they've been living their life in fantasy land and who are actively seeking the truth. But by and large, when, when the secret power structure says that a nation or world of people who do not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence and thus are stakes on the table by choice and consent. They're absolutely right about the majority of people. However, if you love the Most High and you desire to serve Him in spirit and truth, get ready to uncover the true origins of your Christian practices. If you're ready to challenge the established assumptions of the contemporary church, then brace yourself for a work that could be both unsettling and enlightening, perhaps even life-changing. Most people have a good education. They have a good mind. They're capable of understanding if they're taught and if they're taught correctly. And I think it's time to teach people what the truth is and quit hiding it so that we can come together as one humanity and make a balance and live together in a balance. See, it's hard for people to get this because this thing has been so, we've been, we've been under this deception so long, it's like when you try to wake somebody up, I told you it's like the matrix, you can't wake people up because they almost want to believe the lies. According to the online Britannica, Christianity is defined as a major religion stemming from the life teachings and death of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ or the Anointed One of God, in the first century CE. It has become the largest of the world's religions and, geographically, the most widely diffused of all faiths. It has a constituency of more than two billion believers. 
Its largest groups are the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, and the Protestant Churches. Now, we want to ask you a few questions. Number one, in the Bible, where does the term Christianity appear? Two, where does the Bible indicate that Christianity is a prominent global religion among the largest in the world? Well, that only goes to show, Archer, that Christianity is universal. Three, where in the Bible are the assertions about the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Churches, and Protestant denominations all following Catholicism supported? Lastly, does the faith outlined in the Bible promote a singular path to entering the kingdom of heaven? Or does it endorse multiple faiths and pathways? We know some of you might be thinking about the word Christian that is in the Bible. Let us examine that word a little closer. The word Christian was only used three times in the entire New Testament scriptures. It was first used in the book of Acts chapter 11 verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The Greek word used for Christians is Christianos, from Strong's number 5546, which means a Christian or follower of Christ. Christianos is from the Strong's number 5547, Christos, noted as the Anointed One, Messiah, or Christ. Before diving deeper into the word Christian, we want to make it clear that this study is not an attempt to bash Christians. It is solely to bring understanding. There is a connection and a history to the word Christian that we find astonishing. The English word Christian originates from the Greek term Christianos, which traces its origin to the word Cretan. When you look up the word Cretan in the American Heritage Dictionary of the English language, you will see that it is defined as a person with Cretanism a person considered to be foolish or unintelligent. From vulgar Latin Christianus, Christian, human being, poor fellow, from Latin Christianus. So as you can see, the name Christian connects to the word origin Cretan, which is defined as a foolish or unintelligent person. Studies show great evidence that the book of Matthew was written in Hebrew. It is also important to understand that the Bible is an ancient text originally written in Hebrew. The Bible translations to Greek, Latin, and English came much later. In the Gospel of Matthew by George Howard, it is revealed how the original book of Matthew was written in Hebrew. On the left side, the text reads in Hebrew. On the right, it is written in English. The original Hebrew word for Messiah or anointed one was Strong's number 4899. It was never the word Christos that connects to the word Christ that we see today. In the Hebrew Gospels, Sepharad, the Gospel according to Matthew, a writer by the name of Justin J. Van Rensburg wrote an English translation of the Hebrew script from the Vatican Library. As you read throughout the text, one thing we have found interesting is that you never see the word Christ. It is always the original Mashiach, or the word Messiah, indicating that Christ was a word that was later thrown into the scriptures. Now some believers may say, why should I care? I do not speak Hebrew, but is that really true? Have you ever said hallelujah? Hallelujah, brothers and sisters, hallelujah! A universal Hebrew word that means praise you, Yah, giving esteem to our creator, Yah. Have you ever said Satan when referring to the adversary? How about the Hebrew word Sabbath, which refers to the Heavenly Father's holy day of rest, 
Do you end your prayers with the word Amen? These are just a few of the Hebrew words still noted in our English Bibles today. Now you may be asking yourself, so where did the word Christian stem from? If we do a little research, the answer becomes clear. In the Nelson's Quick Reference Bible Dictionary, it says this about the word Christian. The disciples, we are told in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26, were first called Christians at Antioch on the Orantes, somewhere about A.D. 43. They were known to each other as, and were among themselves called, brethren, disciples, believers, and saints. The name Christian, which in the only other cases where it appears in the New Testament is used contemptuously, could not have been applied by the early disciples to themselves, but was imposed upon them by the Gentile world. If you look up the word contemptuously, you will see that it means a deep hatred or disapproval, a scornful way that shows disdain. The truth is, Yahushua, our Hebrew Messiah, never referred to himself as a Christian, nor did he designate his followers as such. If you look throughout the entire scriptures, you will never find a single verse where Yahushua gave a commandment or suggested that we be called Christians. If you research deeper, you will see that Antioch, the place that is said to be where the disciples were first called Christians, was an ancient Greek and Roman pagan city. We are told in the scriptures as believers to follow how Yahushua walked in 1 John 2 verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Also in John 14, 6, he states, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It is the example that Yahushua gave to his disciples, apostles, and followers that we are to imitate as believers. So we have to ask ourselves, how did the word Christian happen to appear only three times in one of the largest spiritual books ever written that was inspired by our Creator and Heavenly Father, Yahuwah. Apostle Paul warned the other apostles in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 28 and 29. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of the Almighty, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Apostle Paul foretold of a time that would come after his departure when false teachers speaking twisted things would arise among the true apostles to lead believers astray. Following the time that Apostle Paul spoke of, the first apostles had all died, and the called out assemblies and saints were spreading without them. This was a time when the faith became infiltrated and an unauthorized religion was growing in Rome. Believers suffered great persecution. Eventually, a clash between the pagans and newfound believers arose. We must listen to Paul's prophecy because he left us clues on things that would take place concerning the faith. His warning applied to those apostles and also future believers, as there were many prophets, disciples, and apostles killed for the faith, and many impostors have crept in. Now, let us examine the word Christians and Christ. Many contemporary Christians are unaware of Serapis, a deity worshipped as early as 200 BCE by followers who were called Christians. This was before Yahushua walked the earth. In a letter to the consul Servianus, Emperor Hadrian writes, those who worship Serapis are Christians and those who are especially consecrated to Serapis, call themselves the bishops of Christ. According to an article on Tour Egypt, 
It gives more evidence of Emperor Hadrian's correspondence. It reads, Egypt, which you commended to me, my dearest Servianus, I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent, and continually wafted about by every breath of fame. The worshippers of Serapis here are called Christians, and those who are devoted to the god Serapis, I find, call themselves bishops of Christ. The Serapis cult emerged as a Hellenized adaptation of the ancient worship of Osiris, a move initiated by King Ptolemy Soter to foster harmony between his Greek and Egyptian members. Historical evidence suggests a monastery was affiliated with the Serapium at Memphis, as revealed by Papyri that was discovered in that location. Interestingly, Christian monks drew inspiration from the practices of Serapis followers, possibly influencing the establishment of Christian monastic traditions, a phenomenon with roots in Egypt. The truth is, the true worshipers of Yah and followers of our Messiah Yahushua never called themselves Christians. Instead of Christians, they were referred to as the Kodeshim or set-apart ones. Yahushua never referred to himself as Christ, nor did the disciples and apostles call him Christ. He was called Mashiach or Messiah. Now, after discovering the truth about the word Christian, you must ask yourself a very important question. How did Christianity become one of the largest modern-day religions, with a claim of over two billion believers? Especially considering that the word Christianity is not found in the original Hebrew Bible or any other Bible. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. If our Messiah himself says only a few find the way that leads to life, then our question is, why are we being told Christianity consists of billions of believers? History and research show that Christianity is a religion that emerged from the fringes of the Roman Empire. The original faith began as a Hebrew and Messianic sect in Judea and Galilee, where Yahushua initiated his teachings and early ministry. Let me take you back to the time of Emperor Constantine, a period when the Roman Empire was bustling with diverse beliefs and practices. One notable faith of that era was Mithraism, a religion centered around worshiping the sun, symbolized by Mithras Solus Invictus, the unconquered sun. This religion had its secrets, known only to a select few initiates, mainly soldiers of the Roman army. These soldiers marching across the empire's vast territories via the well-built Roman roads spread the teachings of Mithraism far and wide. From 222 BC to the 4th century AD, Mithraism reigned as the primary religion of the Roman Empire. History reveals that Messianic believers significantly compromised their beliefs to convert pagans into believers with Mithraism standing as its primary rival. Yet, despite Mithraism's popularity, the Messianic faith faced a different path. To attract followers, Messianics underwent significant changes, adapting its beliefs and practices to appeal to pagans. This historical compromise, while successful in converting many, led to a diluted version of the original faith. Exploring Emperor Constantine, Mithraism, and the historical backdrop of the Roman Catholic Church offers valuable insight into many beliefs and practices of this present day. The roots of Mithraism itself trace back to a fusion of Chaldean astrology from the priests of Marduk, 
with Indo-Iranian beliefs in Mithras, a sun idol referred to as the Lord in both Avesta and Veda scriptures. The blending of these concepts under the vague title Lord is reminiscent of syncretistic expressions like Hair Krishna and Hallelujah in the song My Sweet Lord by George Harrison of the Beatles. Into my sweet lord, into jealous guy, into photograph. Come on. The Christ figure goes all the way back to Krishna. By the fourth century AD, the messianic sect known as the Nazarim had largely disappeared, replaced by Gnostic variations and competing with Mithraism for dominance. Some historians argue that Messianics didn't conquer Mithraic paganism. Rather, Mithraism adapted and changed its name to blend in seamlessly. Emperor Constantine played a pivotal role in this transformation by officially endorsing the Messianic faith as the state religion, although in a form far removed from its early roots. To consolidate his power over a diverse empire, Constantine orchestrated a merger of the Nazarene faith with Methrism, resulting in what we recognize today as Christianity, particularly embodied by the Roman Catholic Church. This blending, often justified as enculturation, diluted the original message of repentance beyond recognition, leaving a legacy shaped by political expediency and religious compromise. Thanks to the well-connected and far-reaching Roman road network, Mithraism, a religion with Persian origins, spread widely from Rome. As Emperor Constantine's era dawned, the incoming Nazarene faith intertwined with Mithraism, birthing a unified and widespread Catholic religion. The long-standing customs of Mithraism, influenced by ancient figures like Nimrod, found easy acceptance due to their societal familiarity. However, amidst this blend, the true teachings of Yahuwah became obscured by a veil of pagan practices, forming the foundation of what we now recognize as the RCC, the Roman Catholic Church. It's vital to remember the definition we shared about Christianity. Britannica and many other sources have declared that Christianity's largest groups are first, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, and the Protestant Churches. If you do some research, you will see that the Roman Catholic Church is the mother religion. It started before the Orthodox and Protestant churches. These churches branched off from the RCC because of a complex mix of religious and doctrinal disagreements and political conflicts. Christianity is tearing apart. And just when we need unity most, you create confusion. Although they disagreed on some things, many of the RCC's practices were upheld and continue to this day. Some of you, your loved ones are sick in the hospital and all that stuff. You go right down to the chapel in the hospital. Right. Where this image is there. That's right. And talk to this image. Amen. Now, let's see those images here or see Amen. or smell. Amen. Remember, let's get some Bible. Psalms 115. Listen, follow me in the Bible. Give chapter and verse. Psalms 115 and begin at verse 4. Listen. Their idols are silver and, and gold. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. This is the work of men's hands. They have mouths. They what? They have mouths. <laughs> but they speak not. <laughs> Amen. They have mouths, but they speak not. Hail Mary. Speak not. Hail Mary. Speak not. They have Hail Mary. Speak not. Have mouths, but speak not. I must not. be doing something wrong. Amen. Because you people out there saying she healed you. That's, That's right. what they said, didn't That's they? Right. You people out there saying she healed you. Amen. 
Listen at the book. Oh, yeah. this is good. They have mouths. They have what? They have mouths. But mouths. They, but they speak not. Can't talk. Can't talk. Eyes have they. <laughs> Eyes have they, but they see not. Amen. Eyes have they, but they see not. Amen. Can't see me. Tell me how they see you praying. That's right. God say they have eyes and can't see. see how did they see you praying? Amen. Amen. Now my haters will say, you're disgusting. All right. Now come and tell me how did she see you praying? That's right. That's right. Listen. They have ears. They have ears. But they hear not. So if the Bible said they have ears and don't hear you. Don't hear. Why are you talking to it? That's right. <laughs> why are you down there? Hail Mary, the mother of God. This ain't nobody's mama. That's right. This is nobody's mama. Amen. It is I. That's what it is. Here are a few examples. The crosses we see in churches and crucifixes worn around necks. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The false Jesus image inside of churches and other idols propagated across all denominations. Satan have used symbolism. Right. Have used imagery and symbolism. Yeah to trick the ignorant yeah. and to promote wickedness. Yeah. Now, this have no place, no place. in God's house. Amen. This is not Jesus. That's right. Did you hear what I just said? He ain't Jesus. No. And he's sure ain't Jesus. That's right. And what they did with the so-called white Jesus was use imagery so people of color can look at the preacher, mm -hmm. then look at the image, and notice that the preacher in the image resemble. That's right. And then make them believe that bowing to Jesus is bowing to the preacher. That's right. That's why you people still bow to the Pope. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. We bow to no man. Amen. Now, many of you have this in your church yeah. and in your house. Yeah. Some of you go and kiss the picture. Yeah. Some of you say that the eyes of statues and pictures cry blood. Yes. Some of you are bowing in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, yeah. in the name of whose son is this? Whose son is that? I, I mean, whose son is this fella? That's right. This is Baal's son. Baal's son. This is the devil's son. This is the son of a liar. You would say, oh, he called Jesus a liar. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. So get up off your knees. Stop making a cross. Get up off your knees. That's idolatry. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. 
he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Believing you have to worship in a church building to be a true believer and be saved and calling a church building a home for the sick. The biblical word church never referred to a building. It referred to an assembly, which is the body of believers. In the Strong's Concordance, Greek number 1577, Ecclesia, the word church is defined as an assembly, congregation, or the whole body of believers. Properly, people called out from the world and to God, the outcome being the mystical body of Messiah, i.e., the universal, total body of believers whom God calls out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that the Most High had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Now if you replace the proper name and meaning for the word church in this verse, you will see that assembly or body of believers is the proper wording and meaning. Furthermore, when it comes to the saying that a physical church building is a home for the sick, we have to go back to what Yahushua declared in Luke chapter 5 verses 31 and 32. And Yahushua answered them, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Only Yahushua is the hope for the sick, not a physical church building. Those in the world who are hurting and spiritually sick are healed by accepting Yahushua into their hearts, belief in Yahuwah through his son Yahushua for salvation, and repentance by turning back to Yahuwah's commandments. That good news does not have to be preached in a physical building for this transformation to take place. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And finally, taking center stage is the continuation and observance of man-made pagan holidays like Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, Easter, Valentine's Day, and more. It's important to know that our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah's holy days, such as his festivals and feast days, have been changed and hijacked into pagan traditions and festivals. This deception was prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. How can you say, we are wise and the law of Yahuwah is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. As our story draws to a close, it's evident that organized churches of this world have moved so far down a crooked path. It's critical in these perilous times that we start opening our Bibles and reading them for ourselves, so we are no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men as mentioned in the book of Ephesians. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Let's turn back to the original order and word of Yahuwah, and worship Him in spirit, and nothing but the truth. <laughs>